Hello, I'm Stuart Childs and I'm going to be filling in for Emma Louise for the next few months. So you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. Now that the close period for chemical nitrogen and phosphorus applications has passed, I asked William Burchill, Chagas Dairy Gold Joint Programme Facilitator, who has a huge amount of knowledge in the area of soil fertility, if farmers can put away the fertiliser spreader now until 2023. Well, no, Stuart, there's a lot of actions that actually do need to be taken out on farms, you know, regarding fertiliser and nutrient management going into the awesome. And I suppose really the first thing I'd encourage people to do is, you know, they do, it is a good time of the year now to to sit down and actually pull out soil samples and see, you know, what paddocks are low on lime, what paddocks are low on peas and keys, you know, because this is a good time of the year, you know, to be able to look at that and see what needs to be addressed you know so in particular look any paddocks that have been have a lime requirement that this is a very good time of the year to do it if you think about it out in farmers now at this point um you know the majority of all the silage has been has been taken silage ground has been cleared and you know this is an ideal opportunity now to get lime out on that silage ground and get to let, let it have time to work in over the winter and be ready now for next year's next year's crops of silage, you know, to help. And then, you know, we all know that lime, the massive benefits lime has in terms of increasing nitrogen use efficiency, increasing the availability of peas and keys that are applied in both slurries and fertilizers. So that that's the first thing really that needs to be done. And as, as well in terms in terms of grazing ground now as well too, you know, rotation links are getting longer. There's longer intervals between, you know. A stock entering paddocks so it's giving us a better opportunity for lime to be applied so also as well i suppose it, it isn't really time yet to put away the fertilizer spreader you know and uh, we have to realize as well that you know k there's no restriction on k to be applied k can be applied throughout the autumn and to be honest with you it's actually the best time of the year to apply it really because it reduces there's a reduced risk of grass tetany um around this time of the year where we're not, when we don't put on um we can put on a bit more p k around this time of the year because there's a reduced risk of tetany as long as we're more conscious and be just be careful in terms of what minerals are going into cows as well so this is a good time of the year to especially now to, to look at the soil samples in terms of key what are the indexes on the farm um you know what is an index one what is an index two I like does do those paddocks need to be topped up now in terms of K? And like an often we we a very straightforward rule of thumb on K is that it generally takes around fifty units of K to move an index. And that's either up an index or down an index. Okay. So um we can look at that in terms of silage ground. And in terms of offtakes then William you're talking about the silage ground, but even from a grazing point of view, what kind of quantities of K are we actually removing from the soil or is there much of a difference between grazing versus silage from a K point of view? Yeah, there's big differences in terms of whether products have been pr- predominantly grazed or whether they've been taken for silage. So for example now, and a very kind of simple rule of thumb is that for every cover of fifteen hundred that we graze that removes three units of K per acre and it removes 1.7 units of P. So like it's a very kind of simplistic r- rule of thumb then. If we do 10 grazings in the year, 10 grazings at three units of K, that's 30 units of K removed. If for, for P, that's going to be around 17 units of P. So you can easily, you know, you can see roughly speaking how many grazings have been done in year to date on each individual paddock and see as well look back at your records how much k have you removed and has have you actually put enough back on to cover what you've taken off so that's the grazing element and another thing that we need to be be, be a bit conscious of is that you know when when stock graze paddocks about 90 percent of the k that they eat is actually recycled so the, the offtake of three units for a cover of 1500 is quite low however where that cover of 1500 is taken off for surplus bales that figure moves from tar- from 3 up to 30 units so like 100% of the key is actually removed when we cut the silage and it's taken off the field so just say if we just for a typical example now we've a paddock it was grazed 3 times 
So that'd be three sixes, 18 units coming off from grazing. And the same paddock then was cut for bales once at a, a yield of uh, four bales per acre. So that's 40 units after going off on that. Plus our, plus our um, 18 units from grazing. So that's giving us an, a total offtake of about 58 units. Okay, so and you can see like that's a substantial amount of K. And as I mentioned already, it takes 50 units of K to move an index. And, you know, and even here now working in the Chagas Dairy Gold Giant Program, we have a number of farmers who are taking soil samples every year to monitor their K and P on their farms. And we'd often get the comment back that any paddock that has been cut for bales twice in a year, they're finding that they are probably dropping an index where they're not replacing that K. Okay, so it's very important to point out so that, okay, while there wasn't maybe a huge amount of surplus bales taken the way the summer has gone this year, that anywhere that has been uh, baled, that all the K has been removed from that and you need to focus on getting something back if you haven't already done something or else you're running the risk of dropping your index, which is going to have an impact on you in terms of future performance of that paddock. Yeah, that's true. And like I suppose, sure, like they are... They are chunky numbers now. We talked about 50, 60 units of key being removed um, where surplus bales are taken. But I suppose really what guys can do is look at using slurry and dirty water to to you know to meet that requirement. And I suppose for people just to have an idea in terms of what's actually in slurry and dirty water, you know, the av- an average thousand gallons of dirty water on dairy farms will contain around four units of nitrogen uh, 0.7 of a unit of p and five units of k so again look you know okay so if we if we've put out three thousand gallons of dirty water that's 15 units of k gone out and also in terms of slurries then as well um you know you're talking about around 29 30 units of k from slurry in the uh, cover tanks per thousand gallons and you know if you have a more open tank where there's a lot of water going into that that 30 units has probably gone down close to 20 units okay so again you know for that particular product now where the bales were taken off with the 60 60 units of key was a, was the requirement if there was a good strong type slurry 2000 gallons per acre that would have been 60 units out you're pretty much covered it's really the ground that say that has not has been cut for surplus bales that has not received slurry is the ones you, do, you really do need to look out for so there was good use of slurry in the springtime especially on grazing platforms william so in many cases there might have been some k of a, a kind of a reserve of k there to be eaten into with the with the grazing in particular i suppose and where some bales have come off but maybe not all the farm got slurry in the springtime so that's what you're saying about taking note of where your fertilizer and and slurry applications have been during the course of the year and trying to address the deficits that might have occurred as a result then yeah that's it exactly and um i suppose we kind of have to be conscious that you know our me- our main message really within within chag is that the slurry is recycled to the silage ground because that has I, you know that has that the high, highest requirement obviously for for k so like you know again the first cut silage if we have 10 bales to the acre second cut if we have seven bales to the acre if we take a third cut and we have another three bales to the acre that's 20 bales per acre 20 bales by 10 units that's 200 units of k removed so you can see why you have to put the slurry there and in general you know the majority of slurry goes there some of the milking platform gets it but then sometimes it's maybe the more watery slurry that's there and that might be close to 20 units per thousand gallons. So, you know, there can be some shortcomings there in terms of the amount of um, K that's going out. So just addressing that then, William, I suppose, uh, looking at slurry testing, is is that an important um, element of your st- fertilizer planning and your strategy around what, fer- what fertilizer you're using? It? Yeah, look, the actual value of slurry this year you could put it at 40 euros per thousand gallons with the way that fertilizer prices went this year so you know and again p and k from slurry is probably accounting for the may probably the majority of the p and k that's actually been spread on our farms and you know the same way that we take soil samples the same way that we test our silage having um 
a value on what in P and K is actually within our slurry is giving people a way better, I suppose, ability to be able to manage their slurry and make um, better, better uses and make better decisions. Like, for example, I would have farmers who would have tested maybe two or three different tanks and they found that their cover tanks have more P and K in it. They save and retain that and, and transport that to the silage ground to get the P and K out and to keep the more watery stuff to put out is used in as a bit of a P and K kind of maintenance for the grazing platform. And also as well, like, you know, it's, you know that watery slurry is more conducive in terms of reducing grass contamination on the platform. So, you know, there's a lot of labs across the country that get uh, that can you can use to get your slurry tested. It's probably costing you around uh, 50 euros, 50, 60 euros per sample. And if you take it, that, like I said, that thousand gallons could be valued at 40 it's a very small investment in terms of making good use of um slurry on the farm it's like in the dairy gold giant program area now there was 128 um slurry samples taken there a couple of winters ago and you know the farmers have on the ground and talking discussion with farmers have made better decisions with slurry and how, as a result have saved significantly on fertilizer as a result Okay, very good. And in relation then to, I suppose, the how often that would need to be done then, William, it's f- fairly representative that if everything is the same on the farm from one winter to the next, that that's how, that slurry sample will stand to test the time for a couple of years. Now, obviously, like anything, it, there could be changes occurring on the farm that you wouldn't be aware of and you need to test again, but it's not something that necessarily needs to be done annually, but it's a very wise investment for given where fertilizer prices are currently. Definitely sure, yeah. And I suppose we, when we um, did that slurry testing campaign through the giant program, the big thing that we found in terms of slurry was the differences in slurry depending on what tank it came out of. Again, we found that you know the covered tanks there was a, a higher dry matter, a higher nutrient content in that. There was less dilution with water. And like we also looked at things like and asked a survey the farmers taking the samples about the diet of the animals, um, you know whether it was uh, cows that produced it or weanlings, and there wasn't much of a difference really between the different diets and the different classes of stock. It was really the differences between the tanks, and I I I agree with what you're saying there, sure that if if you take a sample, I think it'd be and you don't change your system massively. You know that sample could definitely be represented for at least three, four, or five years. I you know. Okay, very good. Um, and in relation to, I suppose, what's your recommendation? Then, so we're talking uh, close period is in vogue now for chemical fertilizer. We're we're okay for slurry and soil water at the moment, and obviously okay for soil water for a long period up until nearly December now in this year. Um, what's your recommendation in terms of application rates and where do we come in with the likes of our murate of potash to deal with deficits in relation to, to K on farms? Yeah, so coming into this time of the year now, I think um, putting on K at a rate of around, you know, if you have a strong deficit for K index one, um, I'd be recommending that you could go on with uh, 50 units of K, so literally, which is literally one bag of murate of potash to the acre now i would caution word say that with a word of caution that i wouldn't be applying that where i'd recently applied a lot of slurry or a lot of dirty water at the same time so like that's that's a good way now and i I will be doing it actually now in september early october as opposed to waiting out until november december to do it because it'll give the, the ground time to let it get worked in and again, like, you know, the farmers that have have done this and I've worked with through discussion groups would have commented about, you know, I suppose improved yields of silage in the subsequent year. And I suppose we have to rem- remember then that the reason why we, w- we will be looking after K is because of the, uh, the the bulk it actually brings in terms of the 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 bulk of silage that it actually produced off that ground subsequently. Okay, and uh, just on, on fertilizer then, I suppose you're talking about the bag of murate there, which is the most popular way of, of trying to address K issues. We see recent figures showing that there's a lot less uh, P and K after being brought into the country up to the uh, uh, June, I think it was June or July of this year, according to the Department of Agriculture figures. That's a fairly significant concern, I suppose, for all of us involved in trying to grow grass across the, the different um, enterprises. 
uh, what what impact is that going to have? And I suppose what advice would you have then in terms of there's a lot of fertilizer beginning to move there now currently as well, predominantly nitrogen farms really. Um, what what would you be suggesting to people in terms of if they are buying forward a bit of fertilizer for next year? What considerations should they be keeping in the, in their minds? Yeah, so like in terms of the purchase of the fertilizer this year, nitrogen purchases from the 1st of October to the 30th of June 2022, they're back 19% on nitrogen. And what's most concerning is that they were back actually 31% on phosphorus and 30% on K. I suppose, look, going into last spring, you know, really what we were looking at was trying to get fertilizer onto onto the yard and there was um there was a big demand and there was um i suppose there was a concern so really we were just looking to try and get whatever fertilizer we could get into the yards last spring but like i suppose now like, like i said Stuart, there's a lot of people buying fertilizer and i just would like people to remember that like you do need to maybe be including p and particularly k i know like some farms will be restricted on the amount of p that they can spread but there is no restriction on the amount of k that you can spread and i suppose you know the big thing that we are seeing as well like and that the reason why we're concerned about these figures is that we have we had been making significant progress in terms of the soil samples coming into chagas annually in terms of you know we are improving our p and k indexes year on year but the last year now they have stagnated, if not declined. And I suppose the fear is that if we take, say, a, another P and K holiday this coming year in uh, 23, that that is going to si- significantly impact our our P and K indexes. And, and as a result, our ability really to grow grass on the farm. I know a lot of farms are trying to establish clover and, you know, the indexes need to be right for that as well. So, you know, OK, if we are costing back on nitrogen and trying to, you know, trying to reduce costs, we can't reduce back everything and expect to grow the same level of grass. So I thought what I'd really be recommending people to look at is, you know, look at what P you can buy and realize that you can buy K and there is K products there. And in particular, there's in KS products, you know, and from my work in discussion groups now, and particularly over the last two or three years, I've heard a lot of people praising um, products such as 29014 plus sulfur. So it's a nice kind of nitrogen K sulfur product, nice bit of nitrogen in it, um, nice bit of 14 units of K and a bit of sulfur as well. And, And in particular as well, like, you know, Another reason, like another reason why we would spread K, one is for bulk, but the other one as well is that K actually regulates the water movement within the grass plant. It's if you look up K, that's one of the things that actually does for us. And like I've heard a lot of comments coming back now from members of discussion group saying that where they had applied products like that or a product with K in it, that you know during these little mini droughts or even extended droughts that we've been getting over the last number of years they have actually been able to i suppose they've noticed that the grass is staying that bit greener you know and then when rain does come the grass does seem to recover better and i suppose the science behind it is that the k does help the water movement in the plant and it helps plant roots when it's stressed so i think i have been saying to my own clients is that you know if they are forward buying fertilizer it's definitely no harm to have some of these NKS compounds and have them in your back pocket for next year, for next summer, particularly if we get dry weather and to switch over to them. Um, also as well, look, I suppose one thing that um, I just kind of, I encourage people to look at is that, you know, in, in the recent figures, we've seen that there's been a 47% increase in the use of protected urea between the 1st of October last year and the 30th of june this year so again like that's significant progress and like we have all heard about that new target regarding the 25 percent cost in emissions that's required and protected urea is one of the easiest ways to get there so like you know again you know some concerns farmers might have about buying protected urea is the shelf life of it so protected urea with um sulfur it would generally give us about six months have a six-month shelf life so again if fertilizer does land 
in the yard, say in October, November. You could count ahead six months for that. And again, any fertilized protected urea then that has no sulfur in it, the shelf life of that would typically would be out to 12 months. So we can buy protected urea and store it and keep it for over the, and, and actually have it ready to use next year. And even to be buying a portion of it, portion of your nitrogen as that will help compared to not buying any protected urea at all. And it's a significant figure, I suppose, William, in terms of if we could transition to protected urea very rapidly, it has the ability to protect more or less or uh, allow people to retain 78 cows per thousand per 100 cows that they have uh, on their farm potentially so it's a in one sense it's in it's we need to do this um immediately and like you've outlined the 29 not 14 there already as one option which is protected urea based in terms of its nitrogen content that is giving people options to address the sulfur address the k side of things as well but also fulfill their kind of transition to protected urea uh, situation also which is good for for the environment obviously and good for the the emissions targets that we're trying to achieve now yeah and in, and in fairness like 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 you're highlighting sure there is good options there in terms of these protected urea products you know like you mentioned we have the k1 we also there's also um a protected urea product there called um 30 well, it has 38 units of nitrogen and seven units of sulfur and like a lot of people what i find is they'll put out their three thousand gallons for first cut and put out two bags to the acre of that is giving them about 80 units of nitrogen with their slurry and the and about 14 units of sulfur for first cut ideal job done so like in fairness you know they they can and they can and do fit into fertilizer programs and are quite practical in terms of how they can actually be used as well like i say so um yeah, that, that, there's definitely good options there in terms of what's, what's available now. Okay, so a very good summary there, William, in fairness. Um, so obviously the job of the fertilizer spreader may not necessarily be over just quite yet, even though uh, people aren't to spread any NRP now since um, the 14th of, uh, of September. Um, but uh, there is role for it in terms of applying uh, increased levels of K to make sure that we get full nitrogen and phosphorus use efficiency next year by making sure that our nutrient status is correct and obviously the lime as you mentioned at the start as well is very important so thanks William for coming on today thanks George that's all for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge and thanks to William Burchill for joining me on this week's show don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagisk.ie. I'm Stuart Childs and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.